Greetings, everybody, and welcome to Remote Work, the webinar formerly known as Can It Work For You, and we've renamed Make It Work For You due to recent events. My name is Jeremy Osborne. I'm the academic director of Aquint Gymnasium, located at thegymnasium.com. And for about the last six years or so, we've offered free online courses on things like web design, front end development, user experience, career skills, and a whole lot more. So I definitely uh, encourage you to go check those out, take some free classes, uh, hopefully learn a little something. Now, Gymnasium is actually part of Aquint, and Aquint is one of the world's largest creative staffing agencies. We have offices in over two dozen cities in the US, six countries around the globe, so be sure to check us out if you're looking for a new career opportunity. So uh, just a few notes, a few housekeeping notes. This video will be made available for free to everyone who registers and even those who didn't. And we'll be sharing that um, on our Twitter account and other places. And I'll be actually using some slides that you're about to see um, shortly, and those will be made available as well. So I do wanna talk a little bit about what you're going to learn in the next hour or so. And this is where the reality check begins. So you began planning this event about two months ago. And there was an assumption that remote work was a choice both for workers as well as for companies. <laughs> well, for many of us, this is not the case anymore, thanks to COVID-19. So this webinar is gonna be focusing on how to make remote work work for you. And some of the topics that we're gonna dive into with our experts include examining the bias and assumptions of remote work, discussing some specific and pragmatic solutions to the challenges, learning how to build trust with teammates and other collaborators, offering advice on how to practice self-care. And actually, we could just do the whole webinar on this, I have a feeling, but this is gonna be a small part of it. And then uh, this last point is about how to build the case for remote work in the future. So again, I'm making some assumptions here that many of you are in uh, a situation where you're being asked or required to work from home. But when things return to normal, then uh, what, what does that look like? And can you do things now to help you build the case for working at home down the road? And hopefully the answer is yes, and we can help you do that. So one of the things here I wanted to, to bring up is during this registration process, we asked you uh, questions that you might have for our guests. Boy, oh boy, did you deliver. So these questions are gonna provide a lot of structure for our conversation. Uh, I wanna mention that there was one question that came up a lot, which was what's the best way to find remote opportunities, jobs? So this webinar isn't really gonna dive into that in depth. Um, we I should, I'll be a little remiss if I didn't mention that, you know, our parent company, Aquin, has an option to search for remote opportunities, and those will uh, be listed. And you can kind of check that out. But of course, uh, Aquin just, you know, we, we do design work primarily, or design jobs, so creative web design folks, uh, managers. And so uh, to kind of expand that net a little bit, I'm gonna encourage you to go to our Twitter account at Aquint Gymnasium. All this week, we're gonna be adding links to remote job sites as well as other remote work resources. Okay, so uh, I want to begin to introduce you to the real stars of the show. We've got two folks here, Richard Banfield, who is the VP of Design Transformation at Envision. And he's also the co-owner of the Out of Office Coworking Space based outside of Boston. And in addition, Richard has also written four books on product design and leadership. And greetings and welcome to you, Richard. Hey, Jeremy, good to see you again. Excellent to see you. Um, and folks, you will be seeing them in just a second, but let me introduce you to our second guest. Darren Buckner was leading the remote work movement before it was cool. We might have to modify that to mandatory, Darren. Um, <laughs> I think so. And as founder and CEO of Work From, an app connecting remote workers worldwide. He's committed to helping companies find quality workspaces for their talented teams. Greetings to you, Darren. Thank you, it's great to be here. 
So one last thing before we uh, dive in, and I'm going to kind of jump out of here for a second. So you should be seeing us shortly. Uh, I do want to kind of get some, hey, so I do want to get a little input from you, dear audience. And uh, we've got a little interactive poll, and we're very curious to um, see those results. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll, and it'll give you, you know, 15 or 20 seconds to answer that. And again, that poll, in case you don't have your visuals on, is how often do you usually work from home? And again, usually being, uh, I don't know, last two weeks, <laughs> how do we define that? So I'll give you a few seconds to do that. And we're seeing those numbers run in. This is cool. Okay, behind the scenes, I'm seeing this. So these are very interesting results. I'm going to tell you that always is leading the pack. Mm. Let's give it five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, and one. Close that poll. Cool. So a lot of you voted always won. I am kind of surprised. What about you, Richard? Is that to the uh, well, I, I'm not sure. I, like, I, I thought maybe we'd have a, some of the audience be um, those folks who have not figured out how to do this yet and are interested to, in doing that. Um, yeah. But maybe, maybe that's like the new normal, and we, you know, we're yeah. seeing that now. Yeah. yeah, it looks like seven percent chose uh, uh, said that they had no option to work remotely. No option. Oh. So, in other words. Most of you do have the option, it sounds like, typically. Yeah. Uh, wow, okay, cool. So yeah, I mean, one of the things um, I, I kind of want to, you know, we talked about this, this structure. Um, you know, last week uh, we had a little run through, and again, I'm just gonna jump in and uh, share my screen again one more time, and then we'll kick things off. So one of the things, you know, guys, when we talked last week, um, you know, we talk a lot about assumptions about remote work. And one of those things, I, I, I kind of stole a tweet from this well-known designer, Mark Bolton, who kind of, you know, was very pro uh, remote work. And he talked about, you know, his opinion that remote and distributed work is more inclusive, it's more productive, it's safer, because there's less illness, offers more balance, it's smarter, cheaper, more sustainable, less commute. And I guess, you know, we could kind of pick each one of these apart and kind of dissect it. Um, but again, when we, and Richard, you had kind of mentioned that, that a lot of these are based on some assumptions. If we flip it around, we can also see the opposite side, you know, that there's also a lot of people who believe that it's less communicative, right? And that uh, there's longer decision-making processes, things are slower. Creative dialogue is virtually non-existent. These are all very loaded terms, um, and and yeah. so there's assumptions on the other side as well that you know remote work uh, may not be a good option. So I'm kind of curious to kind of to, to talk about this idea um, of assumptions and kind of you know how do we define um, a even just what remote work is. Um, and what are some of the what are some of the assumptions that jump up? Um, I'll, I'll leave the definition to to Darren. I think he's probably a better <laughs> expert at the what remote is. Um, but I think what we're seeing across the board is uh, your experience, your background, your perceptions, your biases, um, and and maybe even your culture are going to determine your perspectives on this. About an hour ago, I was on a call with a, a company, 700 people, based in Valencia, Spain. They have an office there. That's where all their staff are, at least until two weeks ago. And now everybody is working from home. So they culturally, as a Spanish company, you know, like the uh, the head of design was saying this morning, you know, we we love getting together and having our coffee in the morning. And we don't know anything about coffee, but we drink it. We don't know anything about beer, but we drink it. Um, it's just an excuse to get social and hang out, and and that's the Spanish culture. And so very very, you know, much through the lens of what work is a cultural thing, and they they 
participate in um, the activities of work because it brings people together and it's an opportunity for them to know each other and relate to each other. And they're struggling a little bit now with this remote thing because they feel like the very essence of their culture is the socialization and, and now they don't have an opportunity to do that. So I think everybody's going to have a perspective based on what they've done in the past and their and their culture and what their company does and what kind of work they do. I mean, we here we are, we're assuming that everybody is in maybe tech and they've got access to the tools that we've got access to. But I'm sure that there are, um, there are people in our lives who, who don't have this kind of thing. You know, they're not that tech savvy or they have service jobs where <laughs> screens screens are already not that part much of a part of their business. So I think it's, you know, I think when we have this conversation, the, it's not do we know what the assumptions are is, but or what the assumptions are, but rather should we know where to start the conversation? And yes, the, the conversation starts around, you know, who are you, where are you, what's your background, what's your culture? So. Right. I agree yeah, with that. When you talked last week, it was you had mentioned, you know, that the definition, like, so be curious to hear kind of your thoughts on like on the definitions. Like, for example, you mentioned, you know, are freelancers remote workers? Sure. <laughs> so, what, what's yeah, it's, a, it's something I, I think a lot about and certainly have talked to a lot of people about. Uh, it's, it, it's not a, there's not a common definition. I think it means something different to um, to everybody, and and it's a very kind of personal thing as well. The most common definition that I've been able to come up with is if you don't feel as if you have to be in any one place to work, then you can consider yourself, or you often will consider yourself, a remote worker of some sort. So certainly, freelancers who don't have to go into you know uh, or go to a client's space to work. Um, they would consider themselves potentially remote workers. I, I know entrepreneurs and um, you know founders of companies often consider themselves remote workers. Uh, so it, it is very different for anybody but or everybody, but I think the the common thread is I don't have to go to some specific place to work every day. I can perform my job duties elsewhere, and elsewhere can be a variety of places or it can be one other place. Um, the other common thread is typically, I can do most of my work online. You know, I most of most of the work or the tasks that I that I need to perform on a daily basis uh, can be done uh, from a distance online. And I think that uh, that's something else that I hear a lot about when people are describing that they work remotely. All right. Uh, you both have, and so Darren, I'm kind of curious too, like if you could spend just a you know a brief second, kind of talking about first of all, you know, what what did what it is you do at work from and kind of how like you found yourself drifting into the, the remote work like how, how did that become a thing that you were interested in and and, and what is and you know what specifically um, are you working on and, and and what's your experience on that okay yeah a lot there uh, I mean my 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 I'll, get, I'll start with my experience or how I got into remote work and then what I work on today uh, I've uh, I've been a long time software engineer, uh, software developer, I held a lot of those types of titles over my career. And so I was able to work remotely, I think, earlier than a lot of others were able to work remotely. Uh, my job certainly was done mostly on a computer and uh, required an internet connection. For that fact, I could do it uh, from afar. I had to f fight for working remotely uh, a little bit when I was um, getting getting started in my career, it wasn't a, a common thing. Companies were thinking about the efficiencies, uh, were certainly interested in letting people have more of the flexibility so that they could be productive, but um, there weren't a lot of standards. Companies certainly didn't have policies around it, and uh, it was all sort of new. So uh, it, it was something that I, I became very passionate about, uh, passionate about um, early on in my career and wanting to you know, really be productive myself. And I found that it was tough for me to time box my productivity. Um, you know, saying that I could be most productive between X and X during a day or in a, a specific place uh, just didn't didn't align for me. And so I often found that I would uh, be working, you know, late late in the day or even uh, into the early morning hours, uh, finding my zone, you know, and, and really being most productive. Yet I would go to an office and uh, and try to do the same. Right. It just didn't align. So I, I fought for that, and it was something that made me very passionate. Um, as, as my career progressed, I realized that there were a lot of great benefits to working remotely, and it was something that I, I really had to be very intentional about 
uh, again, not a lot of, of standards around it. And, but it was something that, that meant, meant a lot to me. And so I would seek out ways to, uh, to make the standards for myself, to find the routines that work well, uh, to find others who work this way. Uh, we, we would, you know, connect and, and talk about how we're doing it well or, or what's not working. And, and I found also a great source of uh, community. One of the things that people struggle with, and certainly I have over my career as well, working remotely, is some of the isolation that comes with it, uh, some of the disconnectedness from from the other things that you might be used to if you're working in an office. So you know, it takes it takes some time to adjust, and that's one of the things I you know I really would like to impress today is you know, have some patience. Um, you know, allow allow yourself to adjust. Uh, you know, you're, you're certainly never alone, and uh, there are a lot of people now who work this way, and a lot of resources available, and and will be more so. Um, tomorrow, you know, certainly we're seeing some, some opportunities right now for a lot of resources to uh, come online for people who work remotely. Yeah. So what I do today for work from is, you know, I, um, I am responsible for a number of things, but the most important things are uh, making sure that we are truly being a resource for as many people as we can. Work from is really a global network of designed to help remote work succeed. Uh, and uh, first and foremost, we care about the humans behind remote work. Um, we understand the benefits, we understand the challenges, the ups and the downs, and we think remote, you know, working remotely is a fantastic thing that we can all do well, but uh, it does come with challenges. We need to be real about that, and we need to understand that we're all in this together and that uh, together we can build infrastructure to, to make that, uh, you know, increase the efficacy of that for everyone. And so my role in work from is to figure out how to do that, uh, to um, to set the vision for for where we are going and uh, and certainly to uh, find smarter people than myself to help execute on that vision and and really be impactful in what I believe is um, the future of, of how most of us will work uh, going forward. Cool. And um, so, Rich, I know again from personal experience that. You know, I'm kind of curious to hear, and you, you've told me this story before, but, you know, once upon a time, you, you had a design firm with some really cool offices, uh, or office, I should say, and then one day it kind of went away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, you eventually get to the point where you can't uh, justify the lease for, you know, what you're trying to do. And I think, it, you know, at the time it made some sense, you know, when we first started the business 15 years ago. Uh, you know, remote working was definitely not mainstream. Um, it was a thing, but it was not mainstream. Bandwidth was an issue. Uh, and also the kind of work we were doing was very hands-on. We did a lot of work in front of the whiteboard with our teammates, with our customers, with our clients, you know, being right there. And then eventually that just kind of wore thin. And we just like, most of us were working from home. And to Darren's point, we were like, we were, we were pushing pixels and writing code and making stuff. and and you know, we were doing, you know, Slack came along and Zoom came along and made our lives a little bit easier. And eventually we were like, do we even need to get in the traffic? And I mean, you know, we all kind of know the Boston area. It's the most congested city in the world. It would sometimes take me an hour and a half just to get to the office and maybe an equal amount of time to get back home. And I realized my competition wasn't going to be, you know, did we have a better office or did we have a more... Um, efficient system. My competition was just going to be time. Like I was just competing against the traffic. I was competing against efficiencies of time and, and my stress levels. Like I get to the office tearing my hair out and I'm like, how am I supposed to be productive now? Right. And um, and we had people who were coming in, driving in from New Hampshire. It was just it was mental. Um, so yeah, between that and the financial, I mean, we, we over two years going remote, we saved ourselves a million dollars and that's serious money. Um, and I think also from the point of view of just attracting the right talent, you know, we were able to see our team grow and they were getting married and they were moving and they were having kids. And we didn't want to say to them, well, if you can't come to the office, you can't play this game that we're playing, this amazing thing that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So just to be good humans, we were saying, you know, could we continue working with these amazing people and not have to require this arbitrary check in, check out thing? Um, and I think that's a point that we'll probably cover sometime in today is yeah. we had developed so much trust. We didn't really care where anybody was. But right. I think there are companies and managers and leaders who are just going to be found out today because, you know, everybody's going to be working from home. 
and that i don't know if i can say this on your podcast but there's going to be some asshole manager who's like definitely going to be the guy who starts saying things like oh you got to check in with me or i need your camera to be on or Mm -hmm. you know you can't leave your desk Um, and we've heard stories like we've seen this on twitter right we've seen people actually saying like my manager needs me to check in with them and if you don't have trust that's the alternative the alternative is some authoritarian asshole yeah and so we're going to find out very quickly who's got strong trust in their organizations where there's good leadership where there's good management and the gaps are going to start to show pretty damn quickly and then people are like you said at the beginning of the podcast going to be thinking do i want to go back to that guy do i want to go back to that person do i want to go back to that company (laughs) Maybe I need yeah. to go find a new job now. So yeah. I, you know, a lot's going to change, and and we were just a, you know, we just experienced that a lot earlier than, than what people are experiencing now. But everybody's going to experience what we experienced, which was, you know, it exposes you very quickly and exposes all that the crap that you're going through and the the process that you don't have or do have and the weaknesses you have and the communications right. and the strategies that aren't working. And you you you, it's good from that point of view because it, it shines a light on the bad things but you also need to be mature enough to be able to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. And when we kind of get to the second section, when we're talking about some of you know, this, this interaction between technology and people, I'm very curious to hear, of course, you know, you, you're um, working uh, with Envision at the moment as the VP of design transformation. And I know that, you know, many people may or may not know, you know, Envision is one of the largest fully remote uh, companies um, yeah. and have been doing it for, for quite some time. So, Since folks the beginning. Are there. yeah. yeah. So, um, and later on, I definitely want to hear the story about, um, you know, your recent kind of virtual meeting, um, which really was impacted by, by the uh, COVID-19 stuff. Um, yeah. But before we kind of get there, so maybe this kind of is a good time to to, to bring in some of the um, the uh, questions that some of our uh, registered you know, viewers and folks who hopefully are, are watching here now. And I'm going to kind of group three of these together. And again, they did come from people, but they really are, um, you know, I chose them because they came up lots of times so we could again any one of these we could probably talk about for quite a while Mm -hmm. so we can kind of pick and choose but this first one here is you know besides adding conference calls and tracking sheets any helpful tips to keep up to date on project status so we should talk a little bit about that about kind of connecting with your um is this uh was this joe joe biden he's worried about his campaign you know what that is (laughs) you know it's weird Took the B out. It's just going to be Joe B. But <laughs> I don't want to be better. I think, I think they're all working remotely right now as well. So maybe they do. <laughs> um, the second one um, is again kind of similar. Another challenge um, that would be I'd love to kind of hear your um, sure. you know insight on. Are any tips on setting boundaries on the distractions that remote work can come with? really feel like this is a huge one. We've got a lot of questions here. And again, especially now where, you know, they, we may have folks who are working at close quarters with the rest of their family and their kids. Yeah. Uh, that, geez, that's just got, so it's getting more and more challenging. And then again, there's kind of this issue of like the technology and um, Darren, you've already kind of mentioned like this emphasis on being human. And yes, we have all these tools, so, you know, what is the best platform for collaborative work for designers in different parts of the country? And again, we could probably list between the three of us quite quite a few of them. Personally interested in hearing what what you both kind of use your you know or and prefer yourselves. But um, it's really this this there's a lot of challenges uh, out there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so you know we can take any one of those, which you know so project status um, like. Let's let's come in. I need to start with that. Like, how do you? What, what's a good way just to to let the folks that you know, um, like where you're at, if you're behind on a deadline, if you're in front of a deadline, um, you know, D- Darren, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, when when you're in that sure. state? Oh. Yeah, lots. Of, I mean, over communicate. I think that uh, that's something that everybody should should be thinking about when you're working remotely, and that can. That can mean a lot of different things, but but it, what it means, I think, at, a, at the core is do the extra communication that you might not have otherwise um, thought to do. Uh, if there's if there's anything in your communication that 
that could be open-ended or leaves potentially a, a logical next question, maybe get ahead of that. Uh, and, um, and, and just think about communicating early, often, and in, and in asynchronous ways. I think um, what's one of the challenges with working remotely is, is being able to know when you can think up and actually be productive with other people you're working with. Uh, because you can't necessarily see them, and in some cases you can, there are lots of tools out there now that allow you to see people on video and you know their status and whatnot. Uh, but if you don't know for sure if a conversation is is well timed, uh, get used to capturing that in in a way in which you over communicate, and then share that early and often with your teammates, uh, and then ex and kind of get get uh, prepared for a cadence that you may. Uh, not otherwise be used to a cadence that looks a little different, but is absolutely a back and forth. And, um, you know, you'll find that cadence with your teammates. It can take some time. I know that earlier in the, in the, uh, in the session here, we, we saw that most people have been working remotely. It sounds like for a while. So they're probably already finding this cadence and it can be a bit messy, but you'll get there. Um, and the cadence will also be different, different between you and certain teammates, you and the team as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, your role will dictate some of those things. Uh, but I think if you are being very intentional about over communicating and uh, again, don't don't worry about the technical definition of over communicating. If you think that there's something that uh, would be useful for somebody to know, communicate that. Uh, and, and if you and if you just get used to doing that, I think what will happen is the the status of certain projects, the status of uh, what you are working on, what others are working on will become more, much visible enough to uh, to be very productive. Uh, and and you also find that that status will persist in a way that uh, others can benefit from. Uh, when you're having a conversation like this, if it wasn't recorded, if other people weren't able to watch, you know, Richard and I may, may talk about the status of something we're working on and others don't necessarily know that. Now we have to take another step uh, mm -hmm. to try to communicate that to the rest of the team. So you can skip some of those steps when you're, when you're working this way by uh, just being very intentional about how you communicate in, in a way that persists so that others can, can follow along when they need to. I'll speak to the, the leadership communication because I think Dan's covered a lot of the awesome stuff that you should be doing as a remote team. Um, you know, as a leader, the over communication needs to, the way I judge it is I say something until it's said back to me. So it's kind of like parenting, you know, you brush your teeth, brush your teeth, brush your teeth, brush your teeth. And then one day they say, hey, it's time to brush my teeth. And you're like, yes, my work as a parent is done. Um, and I don't mean that's sound condescending, but you, you know, you say whatever your strategy is, what your go-to-market plan is, what your uh, OKRs are, whatever your top-down decision-making stack is going to be, that needs to be communicated regularly enough that then you start hearing it back to you. And it could be anything from three to... 300 times before you hear it back. Yeah. Um, and then the, the early and often stuff, for remote workers, you're gonna have to do more pre-work. So I always see the meeting, not as the starting point, but as the end point. So yeah. what are you doing in preparation for that meeting? You're yeah. making sure the right people are there, you're making sure that there's an agenda, that there's a one pager that everybody's read before they even get to the meeting, so, so that you're not wasting people's time. Because you know 10 people on a call times whatever they're billing at or whatever they're being paid at, that's an expensive call. Yeah. So make sure you've only got pigs and not chickens. If you know the, the, the agile pigs and chicken thing, which is yeah. you know, at breakfast time, pigs are committed and yeah. chickens are just donating their eggs. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's meaning time, right? You've got people who are just donating an opinion. Maybe they're a domain expert. And then you've got people whose necks are on the line because their OKR is associated with that meeting or there's an outcome that they are being held to. Maybe they're the, the DRI or the, the person responsible for that. So you've got to have a clear understanding that the meeting is really an end of a process and not like, oh, we're going to get together. We're going to talk something through. There's nothing worse than getting on a phone call. Like, hey, I've got an idea. I want to bat around with you. And you're like an hour in. You're like, why, why am I in this meeting? I shouldn't have even been invited to this meeting. So I think remote working, not that all meetings shouldn't be like that, but I think you know, th there's more prep that's required and leaders need to be aware of that. They need to train that practice into their organizations. Mm -hmm. So let me throw, that's, I, I, like, I like that. Um, so it's kind of like a takeaway, right? That there's a little bit more prep work than just kind of showing up. Yeah, it's just a muscle you have to develop. 
And so one, one of the things I wanted to point out, Samantha's question about what platform do you use when people are in different work zones. Yeah. I actually think it's less about the platform. I think her question is more about people in different time zones. Mm -hmm. And the other thing you you figure out with remote really quickly is that it doesn't matter whether you're Warren Buffett or Bill Gates, or whatever, or just the three of us. Mm -hmm. Time's time. time. Like you can't make time. You can't like go and fabricate it. Right. Um, and so you become very, very conscious of time. I find that remote companies and remote teams are much more respectful of time. They show up on time. They understand time zones. They can calculate time zones in their heads. Right. They're aware of, hey, this is your morning and my evening. Let's organize it accordingly. Let's set expectations. And also when we make decisions and, and, and decide what we're going to do, understand that that person might be going to bed two minutes after that meeting um, right. versus you who just got up and you're like caffeinated and ready to go. So right. um, to Samantha, if Samantha's on the call, you know, to your point, having an understanding of what people are doing during those hours, the platform's less important, you know, whether you use something like this or Zoom or Slack or whatever, it's much more important to be conscious of what people are going to be doing during those hours and where they've already been in that day and what they intend on doing with their time afterwards so that you can be respectful of it. So time is the, is the platform and you need to scope around the work that's possible to do in that time versus mm -hmm. how many people you've got available or how many things in the backlog or any of the other crap that we currently do right now that's what i call organizational conservation right you know you don't want to just shove stuff in because you know you can or because you've got a backlog but rather look at the time look at what's possible and then choose one or two things that are you know capable for those overlapping teams to participate in for a meeting and then you know move it to asynchronous as joan said yeah, I really, I really love this conversation because, uh, you know, what Richard is suggesting is that there, there are a lot of great tools out there. And the tools are only as good as the, the people behind them. And, you know, the, you also mentioned, Richard, the, the awareness and understanding uh, of the people behind the, the tools, you know, your teammates and, and, and knowing uh, how they work best, knowing when they work well, uh, you know, knowing what, what kind of cadence works well for them, what doesn't. Uh, are they the type of people that respond well first thing in the morning there? And if they are, give them a message, you know, at the end of your day, uh, you know, th these kinds of things, just be intentional. And it, and it does take time to get right. Uh, just like any team dynamics, uh, any team productivity, you know, it's going to ebb and flow and, and you're going to, um, to have to work at it. But when you work remotely, the things that aren't working tend to bubble up pretty quickly. Uh, it, you know, when people aren't on the same page or when the tool's not, not right uh, for the team it, it ten or the job, it, it tends to it tends to show itself much much quicker than it can when you're all together. There's you know there's some shortcuts. There's other types of things you can do to get a, get a, around maybe the the communication or the tool itself. So it, it is really about the people, and I'll just keep saying that because uh, we also have to understand and support the people who work with us for us, uh, who we work for, uh, and have some grace and all that. Um, if we're all aligned on what it is we're trying to do. Uh, we certainly can understand uh, how to be flexible and 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 be intentional about aligning ourselves in ways that produce those outcomes. Uh, mm. If you don't have the trust, as we talked about earlier, so much of this is about the trust. If you don't have the alignment on what it is that you're trying to do, uh, these things will become exacerbated. And it may seem like the tool, it may seem like the communication, it may seem like other things, but it really, I think, does boil down to the the trust and the alignment. That's the first place to start. If you feel uh, if you feel things aren't working well, you know, really tr try to examine that or examine that. If you're a leader, be very intentional and aware of, of those things. And if you're if you are a contributor in another way in your company, um, be quick to point out when things aren't working, uh, because, again, they become quickly exacerbated. Yeah. You know, one of the other questions was from Paulette and she asked, you know, how do you set boundaries around this stuff? I think one of the great ways to do it for a leader is to co-author those principles and boundaries with your team. So every team is going to be different. Every situation is going to be different. Every, every, you know, every working environment is going to be different. Like I said, the culture and the company and all that stuff is going to have its own little nuances. And to go and download Netflix's culture manual and apply that to your business, that's just a recipe for disaster. You, know, you can use that as a guide or maybe as a starting point, but co-author that stuff with your team say like you know when do you work best how do you communicate best understanding those things makes you 
uh, a better leader, but more importantly, it gives the, everybody the opportunity to have an inclusive conversation about how we're going to work. And so yeah. because you're having that conversation, you're also signaling empathy, you're signaling yeah. you know, understanding that you give a shit and that you're not right. just like, oh, I've come up with a bunch of rules and we're going to do these things. Like right. when we saw some of those posts on Twitter over the last several weeks as people have been you know, sent home, where their bosses are like, the rule is you have to check in every 10 minutes, whatever, like, yeah. seriously, like that is exactly how you don't do it. That is a case study for, for like getting rid of good people. So, yeah, so on the, on the flip side, so I wanna, I, I, here's a little thought experiment. I wanna, uh, I know that sometimes this, some of my coworkers and folks I've worked with, especially in the past, right? Not so much now, but um, so, so, Let's say I'm, I'm going to throw this kind of scenario at both of you and kind of give you put you on the on the spot here. So imagine, let's say that you have, um, you know, you you want to get in touch with a colleague of yours, and um, you kind of look at their calendar and it seems like there's nothing there, right? Just kind of seems like they're free floating or you know they should be quote working right or doing something. Um, so it's not specifically blocked off. They're not in a meeting. Um, so let's say you go ahead and you slack them and you're you're kind of looking for for an instant um response right and that part of you is like hey so you should be on call you should be available right and they don't and they don't answer back at what point do you kind of you know at, at, how do you manage kind of that feeling of like like ah oh, god i wanted that answer but you're not there and why aren't you there because you're supposed to be there like does that ever pop up and like um, are there kind of guidelines at the organizations you work with that kind of provide that structure? Um, like, so how would you manage that? Yeah. Um, I mean, again, it depends on what you're doing, right? So if I'm a doctor and I get paged, you expect me to respond. Right. If I'm shipping software and you slack me and I don't answer you for an hour, nobody's going to die on a gurney. So let's just like, let's start with like, what it is that you do and the perspective you should have because of the things we do. Right. Um, the other thing is that, you know, if you've, if you've got a colleague whose job it is to respond, so maybe they're uh, in an IT position where they're supporting some, some feature or function that requires instant response rates. You know, maybe they're kind of like, you know, I'm, I contact my person at AWS and I say, listen, we, you know, I'll, so it looks like it's right. at the bed, like what's going on. I expect that person to respond, but my team are a bunch of very intelligent mm -hmm. people who are solving very big problems. And I don't expect them to respond because I expect them to be heads down doing deep work. Maybe right. they're reading, maybe they're writing, maybe they're just you know, beating their head against a wall trying to figure out a problem. Maybe they're in a, like a conversation with a customer right. and they're gonna be in a conversation for an hour and what can we hear from them? That's the job. That's the job of what I've, you know, bought into, like me being part of this company and having them being on the team. That's what we're all agreeing to. That is the social contract of what we do. Yeah. So I think it, it really, like, if you are in a job where you have to respond, yes. But if somebody's hired to do white collar thinking work, decision making, right. and they don't respond quickly, yeah, then they're right. thinking, they're doing the work. I would it's judge that person only on their, you know, the, the outcomes that we've agreed to. So gotcha. we work on an OKR system. I don't know who does, but we, that's something that works well for us, in which we plan and agree and co-author at the beginning of each period. And then we work towards that. And then somebody might come to me and say, I did it. You know, these are the key results and here they are. Right. And I'm like, great, that's fantastic. I don't care whether it took them four hours or you know, four days to do that they did it that they promised they were going to do it and they did that and we agreed that that was re reasonable so i i, I don't know I, i'm the response time thing yeah i don't know it's yeah. it feels to me like almost like the wrong conversation trust again you know being the right, right. Yeah, and i think that's right and we're going to tackle this idea of trust because you know i again so for me i remember when i started at gymnasium and my manager at the time allison I, you know, she gave me like these guidelines. I thought were really, I had never heard it phrased this way before. It's basically to the tune of like, you know, um, if someone tries to reach you and you know, you're out or if you're out, 
you need to get a haircut or need to go to the store or whatever, like anything under two hours is kind of fine. Like after two hours, we might start to get worried that you, you know, something happened to you. And I kind of like, personally, I liked that. It was like, it felt like a very reasonable, like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Like two hours, like mm. should, more or less, that's, that's one, you know, 25% of your day. Um, so that to me, that that felt very helpful. But, um, you know, this issue of trust, let's, let's, let's jump to that. Because again, I do think that one of the reasons that kind of classified it as its own um, thing. Oops, I lost my slide here. So here we go. Um, so again, how how to build trust? And again, we had a fairly good summary from Arthur, uh, who essentially said that right. How do you build a culture of inclusion, trust, and responsiveness for teams that are mixed, remote, and in person? Mm. And um, so again, I, I do think that's particularly interesting, like if you never meet someone, you never actually see them face to face, how do you grow trust? Um, but before we tackle that, I think that by itself is a monster question. Um, but again, to your point, Richard, of earlier, um, this is from Anonymous about how not to do this. So uh, this is, you know, this person is yeah. saying, my managers, and, and this is recent, so these are, this is a team, this is from someone who's a team, um, uh, that is is being asked to work remotely. It's mandatory because of COVID. And my manager is insisting that everyone on the team submits a detailed work plan every morning and must be logged into Microsoft Teams for the duration of the workday. And they should not appear inactive for any length of time. They have to call two to three times during the day to check in. And also, uh, their employers claim they'll be doing random checks on individual workstations just to see what application they're in or even what URL is in their browser. Sounds awesome. Yeah, it sounds yeah, awesome. Does anybody look at that and, and think that there's any trust, you right. know, in that in that relationship? But think, we have uh, to acknowledge that again, this is this kind of comes back to again, we have to acknowledge our situation. Um, and I think we all agree, and it's fairly clear, like that does not seem like a trustful environment. Um, but it puts in relief what enormous um, still conflict and resistance a lot of organizations have, you know, if they have kind of a, a more, you know, they're, they're, they're um, they have their reasons, I assume. I don't suspect they would hold up very well personally, but mm -hmm. this, this issue of trust. So again, I mean, I think that's the extreme. We don't have to really dig into the extreme part of it as much. I'm kind of more curious about those scenarios in which, again, uh, I think, you know, Richard, this applies a lot to, it must apply a lot to Envision, but for everyone where, um, like, you, there is no headquarters, <laughs> there is no office, there is no central place, you don't necessarily know these people. And again, I'm kind of curious, um, you know, to hear, Again, we, we can. I, I really want to talk about or you know hear the the, the experience you had with the three hundred plus folks. Um, but but Darren, like kind of a, so before we get there, like Darren, like what's what what's your take on the trust issue? Like how how do you build trust with folks that maybe you you don't see in person ever or or less frequently? Well, I suggest first of all that teams make an effort to see each other in person. I mean, I think that. Uh, just because you you may spend most of your time working um, apart doesn't mean that being in person isn't isn't very important. In fact, it's it's almost more important uh, it, it, in the, in that environment. Uh, it doesn't have to happen as frequently. It certainly uh, will be logistically very hard to do for some teams. But I really recommend that every team, if they can, or even teams inside of teams. Uh, find time to connect in person uh, at some point throughout, you know, ideally a couple times throughout a year. Uh, that's where the trust uh, can be solidified, but also where it can, can really start to sprout. Uh, you know, we're humans and we uh, are very social creatures. We have, we draw a lot of our understanding around the world uh, of the world through our senses. And we can't do that all the time through text and uh, video. Uh, you know, we need to be around each other to, to build some of the, the layers of trust that I think are important to, to stand the test of time. So, so try to get in person if you can. I mean, that, that's the, the, I'd, I'd say the the number one thing that you can do as a team to uh, to ensure that there is a healthy level of trust. Um, second of all, you know, 
have have conversations understand the people the, the the people on your team not necessarily the job they do or the the task that they have on their on their list but the people behind um what you're doing because if you can understand and have some empathy for people uh, that is the basis of trust and if you work very hard at that and if you are intentional about um, making that a, a a core part of your your team's experience the trust will develop you know naturally uh but you can break t trust very quickly right and and so in that in that example that you showed and i know it's the extreme but that's that's a, a fantastic way to to break any trust that, that was maybe developed uh as your team was working in an office I'm, i assume a lot of people are now finding themselves you know sort of suddenly remote right and i think we have to have some grace at this you know during this period i think you know if i was to get a message from my manager um, and maybe we'd been in an office together or the, or the world was a little different, you know, yesterday than it was today. Uh, I, I would, I would, you know, be very off put by that. And I would probably still would today, but I would, I would imagine also that everybody's going through some challenging times right now. And, uh, you know, we're trying to make it work. Uh, the things that used to work for us yesterday don't seem to be as relevant today for a lot of folks. And if you're somebody who has been, you know, primed and conditioned to, to, you know, work with people in, in a certain way, and that suddenly has now changed. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to show. You know, and it's not going to be pretty all the time. So, if you're, if you find yourself, anybody on this, you know, on this uh, uh, webinar finds themselves in, in that that position, I would say, you know, have some grace, have some patience, work on it. Uh, things things will get better. We're we're all in this together. We're going to be doing this for a while, likely, and 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 some of these things uh, will play out, I think, favorably over time. Uh, so, again, try to be mean person if you can. That, that's an important part of trust building. Yeah. Um, have some empathy for people. Understand who these folks are. What are they passionate about? What do they love to do? What's their morning routine like? You know, understand uh, what they think is funny, the kind of food that they hate. This will allow you to understand the person and then ultimately use what you're born with, which is the ability to develop trust. And you can do that then through, um, you know, through the tools that you have available to you. That's something obviously that can, that can, that can help foster that. Yeah. So, so uh, that is excellent. I, that's very well said. So thank you. Um, so yes. Yeah, sort of, sort of pull that. Can we get everybody to do it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so Richard, again, like the, you know, this, this issue, um, you know, is magnified, right? The larger the organization. And, mm the more fluid it is. So, so I, again, um, my understanding is uh, Envision kind of does do these, these, how often is it, like yearly or, or I don't know what the, the cadence of the in-person? What the in-person, yeah. Um, so as a company, um, what's sometimes referred to as IRL event, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's normally an annual event. Uh, it doesn't look like that will happen anytime soon. Yeah. We had a revenue kickoff which is the sales and marketing we've combined sales and marketing together so that's our go-to-market team and that's about 250 300 people depending on how you cut it um they were all supposed to meet in orlando and and this was going to happen about three weeks ago and we made the call even before we really yeah. knew it was going to be so bad that this wasn't going to happen we were flying people in from all over the world so we we may have had more of a uh, more visibility on the global situation than most companies did, but we knew that this was the right thing to do, and so we just made an online event, and it was incredibly successful. Partly because we are a remote company, and we this That's is right. kind of what we do, um, but also we put a lot of effort into making sure that what we were going to experience was going to have, as Darren said, a lot of the sensory stimulus that humans require to make it very personal, make it lead from the heart. Be vulnerable, be open, um, expect the best of people, expect that everybody's going to show up with best intentions, you know, communicate that so that, you know, we're, we're showing trust before we even receive it. Mm -hmm. and, and then just have a lot of fun with it. I mean, we had a ton of fun. We, we did some silly things. We, we had a, a, a celebration, kind of an awards evening, and everybody dressed up in black tie and yes. got a glass of champagne out. And highly recommended. You know, we just like yeah. I said earlier, there was this uh, team in Spain we were talking to, and we said to them, "What are your what are your rituals?" And they're like, "Yeah, coffee and, and a beer, and we have um, 
what they call Valencia uh, lunch, which is basically a big sandwich on a, mm-hmm. you know, a mid-morning brunch thing that they do on, on Fridays. And they're mm-hmm. like, well, why didn't you do that? Do that anyway. You yeah. know, make your lunches and show everybody what yeah. you put in your sandwich and get the cerveza out and, and like, you know, what are you drinking? And let let the thing happen. It's going to be different and it's going to be subtly maybe, I don't want to say less opportunistic from a personal connection point of view, but it's going to be different. And you've yeah, got to sure. recognize those nuances. And I think the media would love you to believe that working in an office or working remote is a black and white situation. Right. It's like open plan office and closed plan office is a black and white issue. But I don't know about you, but I've never been into an office that's open plan or closed plan. It's always like a hybrid of something in between. There's like 50 shades of openness and closeness. And I think the same is true of remoteness. Like there are very few companies that are exclusively remote. That's right. We meet with our customers in person. We meet with our teams, individual teams we meet in person. So we might take 10 people or 20 people at a time uh, around the country and around the world. And we do that fairly regularly. I mean, I go and see my team mates. Like if somebody's in New York City, I'll get on a train and go and spend time with them. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe not right now, but you know, we that's what we used to do. Right. And I think that those 50 shades of gray of remote working aren't being recognized or talked about because there seems to be this black and white perspective and it's not binary. It's not at all. It's going to be different for every person. Some right, people are yeah. like, I, like one of my team mates, uh, she lives in Moab in Utah. And so she's pretty remote, remote, like physically remote as well. She still makes the effort to fly to conferences and spend time with people and, and work in person with people. So it doesn't matter if you're physically remote, you can still make that effort that Darren's talking about. And also whatever your cadence is, there's some people who are like, you know what, I'm happy in my apartment. I don't want to talk to people. I'm a super introvert. That's great. Cool. Whatever works for you, knowing that, respecting that, and understanding that is the leader's and the company's responsibility. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, was gonna, I was gonna give one one I uh, think please. let me so try try this, uh if you if you're not doing this already. And so I think it's a wonderful way to uh to get to know people on your team, but also to build trust from afar. Uh, find maybe a time once a week, once every other week, once a month. Uh, and uh, get together on on a, on a call, a Zoom, a video call, whatever platform you you uh, prefer, and uh, have one person, maybe two per two of the people, just talk about something that they're passionate about. Uh, maybe teach us something. Maybe talk about your childhood and what was important to you and where you came from. Uh, but but share with us who you are and, and you know what you're passionate about. And and. And have somebody on your team nominate you for something that they potentially see as uh, is interesting uh, about you. And and I think that when you are nominated and somebody wants to, to learn more about maybe, for instance, when I used to work in, in nightclubs as a bouncer in Las Vegas, right? Fun story. Probably a lot of fun, interesting things there. Uh, nominate me for that. When I, when I get that nomination, feel honored that, that folks want to understand more about something in my history or something that I'm passionate about. Uh, you, you'll you'll find pretty quickly you have to think about your teammates a little differently, and you'll get excited about the opportunities to maybe have them share more about what they do. Uh, it won't take a ton of your time, but everybody will enjoy it. And at the end of the day, it won't be something spent talking about work, likely. And uh, you will feel that uh, you you really got to see something about that person or understand something about that person that will now be an important an important piece of what you can uh, use in every conversation moving forward. Important lens at which to look at everything that you do uh, with that with that person, and certainly every other team that you move forward. So, if you, if you don't do something like that, I, I highly suggest you try it, and I think you'll I think you'll see it's a it's a winner. That's a great one, yeah. And I guess if you're if you're a manager out there, right? If you're the one who's in charge of these teams, then I would try to yeah build that in. And if your if your manager isn't, then suggest it, right? Um, all right, we've got like five or six minutes left. The good news is, you know, the, the kind of the last section I was planning on about how to build a case. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know, like, so again, I'm, I realize I may or may not have shared those results. So can you, does that now show up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, um, <laughs> according to these numbers, right? Mm-hmm. Pretty mixed. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, real mixed. Yeah. But again, no option to work remotely. So um, means again. Yeah, I mean, that just goes to show that's the Fifty Shades of Grey, right? I mean, that's, there it is. Man. that's you know, it. If you, 
if you could have predicted that at the yep. beginning of the call, you might have said, well, it's probably going to be two extremes. And the reality right. is it's never the, the extremes. And right. um, you know, people are going to, like one of the things we're experiencing right now with this virus is that the three learning modalities or situations that cause behavior change are happening, right? Epiphany or like shock, right. incremental change in behavior, it's like a new habit, a new routine, and environmental change. All three of those okay. things are happening at the same time. Very, very rare that that happens. Yeah. And so we've got the shock and awe going on. We've got the environmental change, like you're actually physically required to be at home, like by law in certain places. Mm -hmm. And also, this is going to develop new routines for you. You're going to have to figure out how to get the work done and still do as we we're about to talk about the self care. Yeah. And so, at the end of say, let's be honest with ourselves and say this is probably going to take us into the summer, which means we're going to be at yeah. home with our kids through the summer. So it's going to be the longest summer of our lives. We're all going to be in mental. <laughs> yeah. um, we're going to have a lot of new habits, another, a lot of new routines and, and behaviors. And we may not want to go back to what we used to do. And that's going to change right. the landscape yeah. from, you know, talent acquisition and, and real estate point of view. Companies, maybe they don't even want to have a lease anymore. Like it's just going to, everything's going to be different. Yeah. Everything's going to change. I everything. agree. And, then, and a lot of those conditions and those factors that you led, uh, mentioned, Richard, kind of lead into this kind of last section that, again, could easily be at this point in time an entire webinar on its own. Um, but we now know that, again, there's a lot of stresses at home. Again, imagine if you're a single parent now and you also have your kids um, at home, and but you're also expected to work. Um, and, you know, we have this, this question here again, if, um, you know, working from home, how difficult is it to turn off work and get into home mode? And I think that this is one thing that does pop up a lot for people because, um, you know, it's... It goes a lot of ways, right? We mentioned this thing, this idea of distractions, and so that's that's hard enough. But sometimes it goes the opposite way, where it's like you dive right into something, and all of a sudden it's ten o'clock at night, and you haven't eaten your dinner, and you're still in work mode, and you're still answering calls, and of never happens to time zones, right? <laughs> so, so I wait, guess, didn't we didn't we just miss lunch? <laughs> <laughs> So I guess um, you know this last piece is. I mean, again, we could we could spend another hour on this, but right Let, now, let's, do that. I, let's set that up. We could. <laughs> We'd love to. Seems like some great outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, but like so, self care to me again. My my wife's a therapist, and she she talks about this all the time. It's like, how do you make sure that you are taking care of yourself? Because if you're not healthy, then those around you are going to feel those effects. So how do we do this in this day and age? How do we? What are some Things that you do, perhaps, for taking care of yourself um, uh, during during the day and so forth. And for me, it's uh, a lot of it's about environmental. Like I do not work where I play and yeah. eat. Like I do not. I'm. I can't sit on my bed, you know. Yeah. And I highly recommend people don't do that stuff. Like find a place to work where working happens and get dressed and go to work as if that's gonna be the work and then when you're done like as samantha asked like you know change into your pjs and like like your new uniform and your new physical location your new habits like put your phone away you know sometimes i might even like you know hide my phone from myself and we'll leave it in another room just because i don't want that to be the thing so you can trick yourself into this stuff just like you can trick yourself into doing workouts and things like that so but yeah. um we're we're going to be writing um uh we are writing a, a remote working guide which will be coming out next week um, awesome. and i'll share that with you and you can you can spread that to the masses yeah we'll put well so the folks watching um we will be you know the the, the same url the same address that you use to register for this and again you can, you can we'll, we'll be sending emails as well we'll have a list of resources um and so we'd love to put that on um and so for you darren what kind of self-care advice do you have for the for people in terms of anything well, I want to be I want to be really respectful of everybody has a different situation and uh, you know I've been working remotely for a long time uh, in many ways I'm you know, well well adjusted to the way that I work it's taken me a long time uh, I just I still don't take care of myself the way that I probably should so I'm not sure if you ever fully get there 
Um, the great news is you may have an opportunity to actually adjust in ways that can help you uh, with self-care and where you might not have had in the future or excuse me, in the, in the past. If you were if you're required to be in an office, uh, I think we all know that that can be difficult if we have things that we need personally uh, and, and don't necessarily want to share that with everybody around us or uh, aren't in a position to, uh, to take, a, you know, take the time we need in order to focus on ourselves. So if you are now working remotely or you've been working for a while uh, remotely, you, you do have, I think, some of the liberties to be able to focus on yourself differently. Uh, routine is super important. Uh, I, I love, uh, Richard mentioned, you know, try not to, try to separate where you work, where you sleep, where you play, if that's possible. Now, some people, aren't, that's not going to be possible. Uh, and especially right now, there's going to be some really crazy collisions between, you know, your home life and your work life, and it's it's going to be messy. Uh, I, I don't know how you get around that right now. And I think that this is this is one of the things that, that we're just going to have to um, continue to try to lean on each other and to take it one day at a time. Um, there are good best practices. I'm really eager to, to, to read the, um, the guy that you're putting together at Envision. I, I read all the ones that come out. I mean, every team, ha I think, has unique insights on in how they approach things, and, and we can learn from those. Uh, but uh, the separation is tough. I don't even want to pretend that it's that it's something that you can um, just easily make work. Uh, you know, moving from your laptop and then and then to your phone, that's not actually separation. So a lot of people will think, oh, well, I, you know, I shut the laptop and, and then I just went and started, you know, kind of checking messages on my phone or whatever, or doing some research. Uh, the other thing I think is important to highlight is that a lot of us get get a lot a lot out of our work. It's very meaningful to us. You know, we're passionate about it. We don't want to stop, you know. It's it's kind of um, it, it's an, it's it's an important part of who we are, and, and it can be tied to our identity even. So, so these boundaries sometimes feel um, not uh, not intuitive. They don't feel like we even want to have them sometimes, and I think that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but understand that you know the habits that you're creating are likely going to be the habits that uh, you will keep. And so, if you can be intentional about creating some habits that uh, that do give you some some thoughtful self care opportunities. I think you're going to be in a really great spot to uh, feel good both about how you, how you you know where you are personally and your work. Um, the boundaries uh, are difficult, but they are possible. Uh, and I think uh, try try to find something that works for you. Don't don't necessarily take something off the shelf and say this is how it has to be done. Uh, try try different things. Um, you know I do a lot of walking meetings. Yep, that helps. Um, you know I think separating yourself uh, physically from the things that may be a distraction from you, you know, TV, other things, you know, laundry, you hear a lot about those sort of things. Try to try to separate yourself physically if you can. Um, but but again, have some grace. Understand this is going to be, a, a, you know, this is going to be a fluid situation. And as as we find ourselves in, you know, a, an environment like we are today, as we're a fully remote team and this is not business as usual. You know, we even as a fully remote team, we're all going to be feeling anxious. We're all going to be feeling uh, worried for ourselves, for our family members, for our friends, you know, things all around us feel like maybe they are collapsing in ways that we have no control over. This is not business as usual. Remote work is not going to protect us from any of these things. Uh, and, and so I think, we, you know, right now it's, it's very important for us all to be, um, to be empathetic and to understand that this is going to be hard, but we will get through this together. Uh, find people, find work friends that maybe aren't even part of your organization. Join the work from community. You know, we have a, a lot of people all over the world who have been working remote for a long time and some who are just new at it. And we're all helping each other with our, our personal remote work journey. You know, there's a lot you can do. Try it. Um, but again, have some grace and, and understand that, uh, that this is going to be tough for a while. Fine words. Um, mm. And I do want to uh, respect. Again, speaking of time, we want to respect our, our audience's time. I want to respect yours. So we're going to wrap this up. Um, and the any last things that, that you either of you want to promote and things that, again, thank you, Richard, for, for sharing the resources that InDesign, uh, that InDesign Envision is going to, uh, going to be uh, releasing soon. And uh, anything else that you want to talk about or mention? Yeah, well, we've already got resources up. If you go to envisionapp.com forward slash remote, there's a ton of stuff there. The, like I said, the guide will be ready as a, as a book in Excellent. about a week. 
Um, but yeah, there's tons of stuff there. We're going to be doing workshops and podcasts and all kinds of things throughout the week. Because as Darren said, this is definitely not yeah. normal. This is yeah. we are all going to be stressed out for for a while. And yeah, as uh, as Clark, our CEO, said, this is a bring your kid to work month. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would also. So we, we just launched a forum. You can go to forum.workfrom.co, and that is uh, a place where many of the people in our community uh, will be sharing, you know, uh, what help we can provide uh, in this time. And, and I think we'll be doing a lot of other things to help. Um, you know, we'll all be rising up as a community to help each other. Uh, so certainly follow along there. Uh, also ping me directly. I mean, I'm, I'm opening up my, you know, myself as a resource as much as I can be. I want to be helpful. Uh, you know, connect with me on Twitter. Uh, it's at Darren Buckner. Uh, you know, send me a, a, a direct message. They're all open. I, you know, I, I think we just have to uh, stick together as much as possible and uh, we'll, we'll figure this out. Um, there are lots of great resources. Go check them all out. If it feels overwhelming, no, you're not the only one. And uh, and and just try to again connect with people who you already love and respect in your life. Try to try to connect with them more right now. Uh, you'll find some foundation there. Uh, trust your teammates. Lean on your leaders. Uh, be a leader yourself. And uh, I think we're all gonna we're all gonna be all right. Thank you both. Thank you so much uh, for being a part of this. Uh, again, this is the um, the Twitter handle specifically for Richard Darren. Uh, also myself, and again at Equin Gymnasium. And uh, good luck to everyone out there. Be good, be kind, be healthy. let's all help each other. <laughs> With that, Thanks, you, I bid you adieu, and uh, we are officially over. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.